Welcome to Principles of International Relations. In today's class we are talking about economic development. So the primary question is that we do have a large variation in, uh, in the world where some uh, countries are successfully able to develop um, and become wealthy um, developed countries while many other countries are struggling. So we want to kind of highlight um, the different kind of conditions which lead to the one or the other and what kind of factors are contributing um, to these kind of developments. At the one hand we are looking at the, the domestic level um, of, um, of sp uh, specific countries and kind of the conditions, the difficulties there. But we also look at the international uh, factors which help or hinder countries to develop. And <clears throat> by critically analyzing these different factors, um, I hope we kind of get a, a broader understanding about the, the challenges um, and the opportunities of uh, international development. Um, I also want to highlight uh, some of the works of Amartya Sen within this class um, and uh, most notably um, his work on development as uh, freedom. So in this work he's kind of uh, advocating um, that we should not only look at the material aspects of development in terms of global GDP or even individual kind of wealth of the citizens but rather kind of look at um, development in a more um, uh, comprehensive uh, way and including aspects like uh, um, capabilities especially within within this um, definition to see that uh, citizens are not only developing material wealth but also kind of develop their own capabilities and their opportunities within society. Um, I think um, this is a really um, important and interesting aspect by this uh, Nobel laureate and I want to kind of discuss his thesis a bit more at the end of this class as well. So I hope you will enjoy this uh, class and I look forward to uh, going right into the slides. Thank you very much. As I mentioned already earlier, in today's class we will talk about the economic development um, of uh, countries, especially um, developing countries. Um, which are kind of after, um, during or after the, the Cold War. Um, and what I want to understand here is what kind of key factors are deriving uh, economic development. Um, so the kind of key questions I would like to ask here is, um, why do we still have after, let's say, more than 50 years um, of uh, development aid, of programs which are um, supposed to develop countries, etc. We still have many countries which have a very high level of, of poverty. Um, at the same time, we do have some countries which have been successfully um, uh, developing. Most notably, of course, um, we could think about, about um, the development of China, but we can also think about other countries which very rapidly developed. Um, like um, countries like South Korea, um, but also even in Africa, South Africa has uh, done a rapid development. And Brazil has, <clears throat> in, in South America, has developed uh, quite swiftly until um, the, the, the current crisis a, a couple of years ago emerged, which kind of had that's, that's, um, a a key kind of drawback in the economic development of Brazil. But we do see many countries which are actually kind of developing. But we do see, at the same time, we see other countries uh, which don't develop in the same way. And so one of the key questions are, uh, in this class is, what kind of factors can we kind of pinpoint towards um, helping to support development or hinder it? Um, so. So we are kind of kind of looking at this um, from different perspectives. So the first one uh, we could mention is the development uh, while um, from a domestic um, perspective. And there's quite some research done on this uh, in terms of what factors are relevant and what not. And, but we also want to kind of focus on the um, international politics and economic um, um, policies 
um, dimension to see like what kind of international um, um, factors affect uh, economic development. In a lot part of the class, I would like to kind of share some uh, ideas of Amartya Sen, um, which I feel are really interesting and, 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 and good to understand. And this the concept of development is freedom. So the basic idea here is very much that development is not only about economic wealth and economic prosperity, but that is actually um, development is a part of kind of increasing individual freedoms. And this kind of individual freedoms um, can be seen in, in kind of increasing the possibility and the abilities of an individual. So for example, education can lead um, to, to increased freedom because education enables people um, to do kind of uh, develop their own, uh, their own path um, economically, but also, um, and also in, in, in many other ways. Uh, and the same thing is, is, is true for, for kind of um, um, other forms that, and that economic development is not, it shouldn't be seen as only a kind of on a material dimension, but actually an enablement for individuals to pursue their own goals. If we kind of talk about the path of development, um, I think what comes into mind are these kind of very, uh, um, diametrally uh, different uh, developments we have in some countries. And I give you just a relatively random example, but um, in 1964, Zambia and South Korea were roughly equivalent in a form of development, in economic development. And what we found there is um, that 50 years after that, or even 50 more, almost, almost uh, uh, 60 years after that, um, the development went diametrically um, differently in the two, two countries. While Zambia um, is, is, is a kind of, by many accounts, seen as a, as a failed state with many kind of political and, and economic crises, uh, South Korea is nowadays a modern uh, industrial nation and kind of uh, caught up um, with one of the biggest economies in the world, caught up with, with most, um, with the, with the the, the top performing economies in the world. So we do have a kind of very, what we do see here is very different kind of a factory of process. And some questions we should ask ourselves is why is it so hard uh, for many countries uh, to develop? While this is the, the primary aim of most countries to actually kind of lead to this development, it is very hard for them to achieve it. Um, and of course, something which comes out of this is really the idea of what, what kind of is, are the reasons for stagnation or um, um, successful uh, development. Um, and if you kind of look through the, the, the academic literature, we find three dominant kind of explanatory factors. Um, and these three are kind of focusing on, on, on three key aspects. The first one is geography. So it depends on the geography of the country, maybe the place where it is located, et cetera, in order to be able to develop or not. Another one is national political economy. So how does the uh, governments and the nations kind of develop um, their economy? And the last one is um, called domestic institutions. So how strong, how reliable, how trustworthy, also maybe how representative uh, for the, in the um, the interests of, um, of the citizens are these domestic institutions, are they democratic or um, not? If you look at uh, the geographic location, um, so what we have found is that basically location is a pretty good predictor of understanding of how the economic development is. So we found that um, the temperated regions uh, seem to have it easier to actually develop um, their economies in, um, um, uh, versus uh, tropical regions. Also, um, there is um, a clear kind of um, statistical evidence that landlocked countries have higher levels of difficulties to develop their own economies. Um, mostly the argument here is given uh, that landlord reg uh, regions have less access to transportation and therefore have it harder to kind of 
build an export um, um, economy where they are actually kind of shipping their products um, to other parts of the world um, because they have this kind of burden of transporting these products over land or over the air, which is more expensive or much lower than kind of using um, having the open sea and a kind of shipping, using shipping as a, as a means of transportation. We also find that regions with diseases that are difficult to cure, uh, like um, are um, are having harder times in, in kind of developing their economies. Um, something which is a, an important factor as well are areas which are far from markets. What we mean with markets is developing countries. So basically, uh, countries, developing countries, which are um it like in physical distance is quite far from from the target market have higher um, difficulty in developing than countries which are relatively close um to target markets uh, either in in europe or the united states or in east asia that kind of of course um kind of fits into this idea of transportation so if, you, if countries are far away uh, transportation costs are higher and maybe connection to these specific products of these countries are lower and therefore um, the demand and also the costs are are um, uh, prohibiting uh, uh, increased uh, economic development. Also that um, and last aspect which is there is that where transport and communication costs are high with countries uh, then the chances of economic development are lower. Again, all of these seem to be kind of these kind of geographical aspects seem to be except maybe tropical versus temperate regions um, seem to be kind of connected with each other, being away and less accessible um, for for common markets. Mm. Mm. Um, but what we have what, what we can't say is uh, that geog geography, we can find of statistically, we can find these kind of um, factors that they are kind of good predictors of economic development or not statistically. But we can't really kind of say that um, uh, countries within or region, uh, countries within uh, similar geographies, um, we do have big variation as well. Some have done extremely well, others have done poorly, et cetera. In a way, um, um, some scholars argue that the geo geography might be uh, statistically uh, significant in, in explaining uh, economic development, but not necessarily that it is a cause of factor. It could be that most um, of the developed uh, economies are maybe in temperated regions, um, but that this is not um, that they like because uh, they haven't been changing so much over um, uh, the recent century. So mostly there are, of course, in, in, in Europe, the United States and in East Asia. And so, um, so this is maybe more a reflection of a, um, of a, a time component that in this um, period of time, in the last centuries, uh, these specific regions have been dominant in economic um, trade. And, and performance. And so the geography, the geographic factors like tropical various temporary or just kind of, let's say coincidental um, side effects which are significant, but not necessarily kind of the causal mechanism behind. Um, oops, sorry. We kind of think about domestic factors that uh, we can find that um, we, there, there's a large literature out there which is kind of looking at um, what kind of factors lead countries to do better than others. Um, and something which we can find is that countries which provide uh, important public goods um, are um, 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 provide important public goods, security of property and political stability and predictability are all statistically more, uh, have a higher chance of developing their economies. Um, the mechanism behind this, or the argument behind this is very often that property rights are very important and the security of property rights is very important. So that means that basically if companies or investors build something um, that they can be certain that these kind of property rights are respected and respected long-term because if they, 
no like uh, economic development happens if there's investment into future um, into future returns and there needs to be a certain security that these kind of um, future returns are actually materializing the risk is high that the property is uh, and with property mean that doesn't only mean like buildings etc so on everything which belongs to a, to a company to an individual etc if uh, the, the guarantees are not provided long term then there's always a risk that um, these kind of the rights are taken away, which makes investing in this uh, in the in this country less um, less likely and less attractive. Because there's the, the additional risk of um, that this investment will fail and and kind of not materialize in the way hoped is becoming higher when the security of property is not a given. Um, and this is, I think. Uh, uh, ties very much in with the third point of political stability and predictability. Um, so political stability also ensures that the security of property is existent. And predictability in terms of laws, etc., also kind of make it possible um, that returns are, are kind of materializing. So these kind of security of property, political stability and predictability of the system are all kind of three factors which kind of um, um, have um, an impact on the expectation of future returns and therefore really important um, to, um, um, to, to kind of um, understand um, uh, um, for us a development. However, how they are reached can be different in different kind of regions of the world. While we have kind of um, some authoritarian systems uh, which, um, which have shown that they have um, good security of property, political stability, and predictability. Um, many scholars argue that actually um, democratic function, uh, democratic systems with functioning democratic institutions are the ones uh, which are kind of providing the highest levels of um, security of property and political stability, as well as predictability. The argument behind this is that there's an interest mediation is taking place. Um, and that kind of mediation kind of uh, kind of leads to the long term stability. Um, the other thing is that, of course, the rule of law kind of creates some predictability about expectations, how how the legal system is, is changing and also how secure property rights are. So countries which do have uh, the rule of law are less likely to to lead towards um, um, the, that property rights are diminished or taken away. Um, etc. because of political turmoil and issues like this. However, there's also um, a disadvantage about this, and that is that um, um, democratic systems often have, at least in the, um, have a, a shorter term horizon of their political decision making than authoritarian systems, which are kind of um, in a long term perspective. And sometimes uh, scholars argue that this the one is outweighing the other. So we do have competing issues on um, democratic versus authoritarian systems. But generally speaking, most scholars believe that um, democratic systems are superior in, in this respect. Provision of imp uh, um, important public goods. Um, what is meant with this is the provision, for example, of infrastructure. So a, a roads built, is internet available? what kind of other infrastructure is there, but also uh, public goods like education, um, healthcare um, are really important in, for, for an economy to develop because this kind of ensures um, that um, the, the produced goods are actually kind of transported to the places where, where they're needed and also that the facilities can be equipped in a way um, which is necessary for production. A very important aspect here is this kind of human resource component, and that is um, uh, so good educational systems, um, good um, good healthcare is also helping to have a viable uh, workforce, and that is a very important in terms of development as well. We can see um, uh, we can kind of analyze this, and some, several kind of case studies have been done. On, uh, on specific um, or in specific countries where there is a variation across these kind of three different domestic um, aspects, provision of 
important public good, security of property, as well as political stability and predictability. So if we kind of look at the, the African um, continent, Sub-Sahara in Africa, then we can kind of compare Zambia versus Botswana, where Botswana has done much better um, because it had better, the three factors above have been better implemented than in the case of Zambia, which had kind of um, been torn by um, several political crises, as well as kind of uh, changes of political systems and uh, limited uh, provision of, um, uh, of public goods. The same kind of can be seen in, uh, in Asia if you do a comparison between Myanmar and Thailand, uh, where Myanmar, um, uh, formerly known as Burma, uh, has had much higher levels of uh, political instability, uh, a predictability of uh, foreign investment and the security of property their rights there as well. Uh, and as serious the underfunding of public important public goods. Um, so the denial of the citizens of a, of a kind of functioning political system is of course not only important for the in the, the citizens within the country, but also um, important um, um, for for the investment uh, investing uh, companies and uh, and, and uh, um, uh, from abroad because they need to have this undisrupted. Function. And something which is quite interesting to see in Myanmar is that there has been the recent coup by the military has displeased especially Chinese investors because it has kind of led to a serious disruption um, of the supply and of the production of um, Chinese um, companies within Myanmar, um, which is um, quite interesting because um, the Chinese government um, has been seen as, uh, as, as a supporter of the military junta, um, but at the same time, um, above all, is interested in stability in some form in order to kind of build um, the kind of uh, increase uh, the, the reliable production again. If we look at Thailand in, in, in comparison, um, <clears throat> in recent years, uh, political stability has also suffered. And um, uh, there has been a military coup in uh, in Thailand as well. But generally, um, um, the predictability of the system is much higher. Uh, rights have been respected more of the citizens as well as um, as um, foreign companies, and therefore um, for a very long time. And there's a much stronger um, provision of public goods. So what we do see here is that Thailand is is in a way much further developed, um, despite the fact that they are neighboring countries and um, and uh, Myanmar actually should have some kind of um, um, advantage because it is very rich um, of resources within the region. Um, we kind of think about domestic national uh, factors of the national political economy. I can continue with this argument about the public goods and what we do mean with this especially is the idea of, of, of about economic infrastructure, which may enables trade, which enables uh, transportation, which enables um, the production of and ex export of products um, produced in a specific um, in a specific region or a specific country, and that kind of fits very well into our previous um, arguments about um, increased globalization. Uh, where it becomes very transport becomes very important because products are not necessarily sold at the places uh, where they are produced, but they can be sold in completely different markets. And actually, producers of um, of countries um, um, kind of might might um, uh, might shift their production to these developing countries in order to hope to get a better um, economic return. And so in this way, uh, infrastructure even becomes more important because the consumption of the goods um, and, uh, is, is, not, uh, is not meant to be in, in the uh, origin of uh, the production, but rather in a different market. Another aspect, so this is kind of why, why roads, railroads, airport, um, utilities, et cetera, are really important. Another uh, really aspect is the idea about economic institutions. So, the financial institution and monetary system. And what we do see here is that, especially in developing countries, some are suffering a lot 
um, from having a deficient um, economic infrastructure. That meaning, for example, that a large amount of uh, citizens don't have a bank account, that the economy is very for, uh, informal, generally structured in an informal way. Um, and that makes it um, very difficult um, for, for economies to develop, not necessarily relying on external funding, but the development on the domestic level internally. So, for example, on the, on the micro level, and that is something which is um, uh, uh, which is which has been uh, found by scholars like Yunus and others um, that uh, micro lending systems are really important in developing uh, in economic development in, in developing countries where kind of individuals and small businesses take opportunities in order to grow and expand in a domestic market because of higher demand. Very often the problem there is that they are not sufficiently um, resourced and that they don't have the ability to, to get any external funding. So kind of loans, um, how we know them in, in, in Japan, in, in, in Europe, in the US and other kind of developed uh, economies um, are not necessarily available for, for domestic uh, local um, citizens. And that makes it very difficult for them to expand their, uh, their businesses. Um, something like that, um, um, Yunus has, has tried to kind of attach this with kind of micro loan systems, which help um, uh, kind of individuals or small businesses to kind of to develop <coughs> Excuse me. To develop their system on a on a local scale with relatively moderate funds, um, which can help a lot in order to kind of improve their businesses, their business structure, and their their, their kind of future proof of, of these kind of businesses. So this is very um, uh, this is this is an in, in, uh, factor which is becoming more and more important. And there is a big hope that actually, with the with um, the um, with the acceptance and and um, uh, of of um, mobile phones and the kind of widespreadness of connectivity in terms of telephones and the internet, these issues can be tackled in a in a novel and and a more efficient way. That micro loans can be provided to individuals let's say over basically kind of applying online and therefore kind of creating, basically reducing the gap of unbanked people at the same time also kind of providing loans to these um, citizens in order to help them to, in, uh, to develop their businesses. One additional aspect which is really interesting there is um, the idea about um, the idea about taxation, something which is very difficult for um, and, and very inefficient for, for developing countries is to effectively tax uh, um, individuals and businesses because in, in the informal sector, because the informality in, in, in its nature makes it hard um, to, to kind of uh, monitor the, the cash flow and therefore also hard to kind of um, um, ask for taxation. And so a large amount of revenues are not kind of tapped into um, by the by the states because they are basically not visible for them in a in kind of increased um, system where bank, where people are more banked in either being by um, by mobile apps over the telephone or others um, uh, um, governments can um, can also uh, be able to more efficiently kind of um, uh, create revenue streams by taxation. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the individuals have to pay more, but that it can be done in a more efficient and, and fairer way and redistribution can take place. And therefore, actually that, um, that public infrastructure is uh, built uh, more efficiently, but also that the individual helps uh, will are helped uh, in, in a better way in terms of maybe social security, et cetera, or other social help. So social infrastructure here is also very important. And that is something which is underfunded in many developing countries and kind of creates um, a problematic situation. So public health and sanitation are kind of key aspects here. Um, 
So in order to um, provide um, a good uh, or kind of a, a healthy, strong workforce, countries need to have a good health public health system, a health system, or at least a, not necessarily public, but a health system which is accessible for everybody and which is kind of efficiently kind of working with the, with the diseases within the region. Because otherwise, um, the, the, um, the costs, um, the, uh, the, um, it, it, to, to develop human resources is becoming very, very difficult. And one of the key aspects of public health is the idea of sanitation. Good sanitary systems are kind of a major infrastructural project and very often um, um, difficult for, um, for, for developing countries to, um, to provide on um, a, a general level, so for all citizens, etc. And that has something to do with, with the density, but also the, the, the urban planning, uh, um, also kind of with um, how far spread um, um, the, um, the different um, happy, um, places are, the people are living, um, etc. So this is a really kind of very challenging um, aspects of it, but very important in order to kind of um, develop um, develop a, a, a strong, capable workforce. Urban planning is really important in there, which is sometimes difficult for rapidly growing cities. So very often in developing countries, there is a discrepancy between urban and rural um, job opportunities, which lead to, um, to citizens um, moving towards um, urban areas in order to kind of um, be able to find jobs or getting better um, better better wages, and that leads to um, unregulated uh, growth of cities, uh, which often lead to situations like slums, etc., where health and sanitation are very difficult um, to to achieve um, for for the for the citizens. This is not a new problem, um, by the way. Many are European. Um, 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 big cities like London or Paris have suffered from the same kind of uh, issues um, in the in the nineteenth century, especially um, where where the, the, this was very difficult um, to to kind of develop um, uh, structures um, um, which which are su um, sufficient for everybody to provide this um, um, healthy environment. Urban planning, in, in, at least in Europe, became and also in the United States, became much stricter to kind of um, target these issues. And we have seen the same thing in countries as like Japan and also um, in, in, in Chinese cities as well. So we do across the uh, world see that, um, and many other places as well, obviously, but we do see around the world that urban planning is an, has an important aspect, um, factor in, in developing um, uh, sanitation and health um, on, on the masses. The last point I want to highlight here is this at the level of education. Education is really important in order and um, in order to kind of provide a, a, a capable workforce, which is a, um, which is um, um, which is um, um, able um, to kind of um, kind of um, fuel the the development of the economy. And that was something when we go back to those. Um, um, to the to, to South Korea, something which was really a, a contributing factor, which helped an excellently um, uh, educated um, um, young population help to develop this e economy very quickly, and made it to one of the um, the uh, science and technology leaders in uh, in in the world uh, we are um, today. So education is 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 um, has different aspects in in a way. It has the, on the one hand, it has the broad education that everybody, every child gets a certain minimum level of education. Is uh, the literacy rate is often kind of used as a as an indicator for this. But there are also um, the the kind of establishment of top uh, institutions which help to lead in terms of research and. Uh, uh, Etc. And both are really important in kind of in developing um, the um, um, uh, uh, developing economy. <clears throat> Having said that, the broad kind of minimum level of education is is the most important aspect of it. 
Um, if you think about security of property, I think I mentioned this already beforehand, um, but the key aspect here uh, is really that, um, that there can be a certainty that um, investments which are done at a certain point in time um, can get returns at a later point in time and that this is not threatened by, um, by, the, by the, the risk of losing um, losing these investments um, because of changes in the political system or changes on property rights, etc. So it needs to kind of uh, um, provide confidence that these um, these um, investments are protected in order. And that is not only true for investments which come from abroad, but also domestic investments. Imagine you are a shop owner and you want to kind of, you, you have at the moment more good business and you think that you could actually kind of sustain a larger shop, maybe have more employees within this shop, et cetera, or maybe have a second branch which could uh, which could sell um, products in, a, in another part of town or something like this. Um, then you do need to uh, invest first before you actually get any returns from this. You need to kind of build up the, the, the second uh, branch. You need to hire people, you need to kind of provide training for them and also commitment that they can continue, uh, that they can work for you for a certain time, et cetera. So all of these kind of investments have to be done before you actually get any returns from the decision. And uh, one of the aspects which I mentioned before is the, the, the access to loan, which is really important in order to realize these investments, but also the trust needs to be there that these investments will actually come to fruit. Uh, at a later stage and that the situation is not changing that much that you cannot kind of uh, rely on having any kind of changes. And this kind of commitment is uh, really important um, uh, um, for, for development on the micro level as well as on the macro level. Um, there are some aspects of domestic factors which often argue this or which sometimes argue this that the lack of expertise uh, to manage economic growth. Uh, and that is, of course, this is also um, existence, but very often actually mismanagement can become not necessarily by technical knowledge, but by either um, incentivized um, uh, groups in, uh, of the population which are in power are incentivized to actually kind of exploit um, the, the country to the, their own benefits or the, own, the benefits of their group or external pressures which are kind of changing the, the, the payoff ratio um, for, for the domestic actors as well. So something which is very commonly known here is the rent seeking so that and governments are, for example, trying to optimize on, on getting development support or that countries are actually kind of um, optimizing the benefit for this for a small ruling class and what we have in this is that we do have mismanagement of um, the economic growth but not necessarily because there's not the technical ability but because the incentive structures uh, for the people in charge are different um, uh, are different and so so they are not um, not following kind of uh, gen uh, interests of general development Um, something which, which in terms of uh, in terms of the ideas of political economy, is really important is the mediation of conflict within the country and also with with other groups. So what we do find as is a big um, um, a big difficulty in economic development is um, the interests of of particularly uh, particular groups. They be it particular groups in power versus other groups or being different kind of ethnicities uh, or uh, regional uh, groups which which have been in conflict or in hostile to each other and these kind of different in incentives are really uh, are really have a big influence on economic development as well so we do find regions where there's there's ethnic or uh, religious or or other forms of uh, um, uh, uh, group dispute have a much harder time to find uh, to develop economic uh, developments. One of the aspects here is that very often economic development is not equally fair to all groups in society. 
and without having a kind of unified uh, governance uh, and structure, it is very difficult um, for kind of um, allowing certain groups in society to be more successful, at least temporarily, than others. Mm. However, what I would like to emphasize here is that we don't find any um, any effect of the political system. So it is not authoritarian systems and democratic systems have the same kind of uh, difficulty in, or in if, uh, if the country is kind of struggling with a, um, ethnic or regional or religious um, um, conflict. It is not that authoritarian systems or democracies are better in kind of overcoming that, at least in the short to medium term. In the wrong one, the expectation is that democratic systems are better in mediating conflict and creating solutions which are um, um, which are weighting the, the different interests uh, equally. Um, but there is no empirical ev statistical evidence um, for showing this in the long run yet. Um, generally speaking, an, an ex, um, an, uh, something which we do find is that uh, countries which are enabling uh, to uh, encompass coalitions which connect broader social welfare systems are better overcoming um, uh, issues between regions and, and, and ethnic groups and therefore uh, uh, better in, in developing, uh, economically developing uh, than others. So it is a kind of these kind of broad coalitions um, and mediation of, um, of conflict is an es at essence in order to have economic development. Um, what I want to kind of highlight here in this, on this slide is the idea about the so-called resource curse. So something which we find very often is, and it is maybe in a way puzzling, is this, uh, this um, this idea of uh, Paul Collier, an Oxford scholar who has kind of done a, a extensive research on this, is the so-called um, research curse. And what we do find is that countries which are very rich in natural resources um, are very often some of the poorest in the world. So the Democratic Republic of Congo might be the prime example uh, of that. It is kind of in terms of minerals, uh, diamonds, oil, uh, and, and other uh, um, precious stones, gold as well. Um, it is seen as the richest country, uh, like in natural resources, one of the richest countries in the world. But at the same time, uh, in terms of GDP and um, um, the, the development of the, the individual lives, it is one of the, one of the poorest. And so something, this is seen as a, uh, as a paradox uh, between the two, um, the two different aspects. So rich in resources, but uh, like economically poor. At the same time, we do find some countries like Japan, for example, which are relatively poor in natural rich resources are becoming very uh, developed wealthy economy or not becoming are very wealthy uh, developed economies. And uh, among, in, in terms of GDP among the richest um, in the world. So uh, um, this kind of statistical puzzle has been, um, has, been, uh, has been extensively kind of researched. And um, one of the, 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 the reasons where this comes from is very often that um, governments, which are oh, one of the kind of the, the most prominent um, um, theories behind this is that governments which have an uh, which have access to natural resources very often don't rely in the same way on tax-based um, revenue funding uh, um, than, than uh, countries with little um, um, natural resources. Why? Because they can bypass these resources. Um, um, the, 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 in the, the citizens' um, development and kind of take a taxation on selling these resources maybe abroad. So in this way, um, uh, economic development is not necessarily a key interest of, of, um, of, of the government. Another aspect here is, um, um, another aspect is that, um, that uh, countries also 
very often are brought by conflict because um, governments or regional leaders can kind of use these natural resources as rent seeking. So they can actually kind of sell these in order to fuel certain conflicts and enable them to actually have lower stability within the country. Another thing which we really find in, um, in, in the Democratic Republic of, of Congo is that regional clans and regional kind of conflict can go on for a very long time because this, uh, if a, a clan heads um, have access to these, uh, to these regional resources, they are able to sell them and then kind of sustain conflict um, over an extended period of time, which without these resources might not be possible. However, we do have countries which are a counter example, um, and that is and the most prominent here would be Norway, where there is a sovereign wealth fund where these kind of the wealth which is coming from these kind of natural resources is not kind of carried directly into the into the economy, but rather invested in order to kind of have specific goals, like for example, increasing the pension funds or the healthcare system, etc., for all citizens. So in this way, there are kind of measurements uh, which could be seen to overcome this kind of research curse, um, but it is without kind of intervention, it is something which is seen as a problem within resource rich countries. Um, in a way, um, in a way, if we kind of look at the international dimension of political economy, um, then there are kind of, we can see two different kind of streams um, of argument. At the one end, we can see that rich and poor countries have shared interests. And especially in a, in a globalized world, a relationship can be cooperative and mutually beneficial for, for the poor countries as well as the, um, as the rich countries. And in terms of uh, the um, division of labor and shared labor, we do see that, um, that developing uh, um, can be beneficial for, for the, the countries which are developing, but it can also be um, beneficial for the developed world in order to kind of um, save resources and save um, labor, etc. So we do find uh, that there is this kind of uh, interconnectedness between the developing countries and the developed countries. However, that doesn't mean that it is without kind of um, a clash of interest. So in a way, in this kind of distribution, there is all often a clash of the benefits of the cooperation. And very often developed countries are more powerful and, and are not necessarily purely interested in the development of the, of the uh, uh, developing countries, but rather in their own, uh, maximizing their own individual profits. And that can lead to developments which are not necessarily in the, in the, to the benefit of the majority of the citizens in the country. Um, we have seen this um, in, in, in several countries in Latin America, um, also in, in, in African countries, etc., where we do see this, um, um, this uh, quite frequently happening. Um, it is even, even issues like um, development aid, which is purely kind of, uh, which is primarily kind of um, de developed by, develop, uh, by developed countries um, to, to help some of the, of the poorest countries in the world. Um, what we do find if we kind of do kind of more closer analysis of it is that um, very often these kind of development aids are uh, connected with, um, uh, with, um, with conditions which are not always favorable for the, for the receiving country. And another aspect is that some countries are then develop, not necessarily developing their economy independently anymore, but rather kind of try to optimize the economy to increase, to kind of optimize on these uh, development aid, which is in the long run, not necessarily beneficial for the country. Um, there's also lots of research in something called development shocks. That means like if countries are, for example, because of domestic, like developed countries, because of uh, economic downturn or something else is a kind of um, reducing development aid. Um, that this has a very bad effect on the on the receiving countries as well. Um, so we do find very mixed kind of results with this interconnectedness. At times, and, and, and generally speaking, the, the interests are aligned between the developing countries and the developed countries. 
but there is conflict and very often in these conflictual situations the developed countries are more powerful and therefore can kind of promote their own positions better than the developing countries and so we do find situations where developing countries are suffering by disconnectedness. Another kind of aspect which is very often kind of um, uh, as seen as a, as a key factor is the, the effect or the legacy of colonialism. Um, um, where, where this kind of, where um, the colonial powers at the one hand kind of um, maybe um, integrated or kind of uh, led to a closer cooperation with the with the, um, the later independent countries, but much more that actually kind of that they led to a destruction of the the economic structure within these uh, the uh, the colonies, and therefore kind of let the, left them at a disadvantage in a globalized world. Uh, and so, so we do find that actually there are different um, different kind of countries depending on their on the or different colonies depending on their situation, while countries which come out like Canada, Australia, which were kind of basically used by settlers to live um, in them, uh, were maybe able to successfully develop um, as independent countries, while countries which were basically used for um, to exploit the regions for their, for their, um, for their resources and for the benefits of, um, of the colonial power, had much more difficulties in adjusting uh, um, uh, adjusting uh, to, to uh, the post-colonial time. And so we do find that the, uh, more and more research shows that this is understudied and that we need to know more about what there are, are the effects of post-colonial um, uh, structures and how they, they kind of inhibit uh, economic development. There are other kind of more general questions in the international political system, which have been raised by anti-globalization movements and, um, and in the research literature as well. And what we do find here is that some argue that the institutional structure, institutional setup of the, uh, the IMF, the World Bank, etc., are kind of structured in a way which overproportionally uh, benefit uh, the developed world and uh, and are biased against low developing countries. And so one of the, the criticisms about this is that this is not kind of leading to a fair uh, situation where uh, um, developing countries uh, can develop um, 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 based on their own abilities, but that they are actually struggling by this kind of international system. It can be definitely seen in this in the discussion between this, no, the global north and the global south. One of the when of kind of way of structuring developed versus developing uh, world, the global north being very of uh, then as synonymous with the developed world, while the global south is seen as a uh, um, synonymous with the developing world. And a lot of scholars ask for um, a shift in the balance structure between the different. Um, the different blocks and that the developing world needs to have a bigger say in international political economy and also in the in the measurements which are kind of agreed and coordinated on. Um, but as I said, this is often seen that institutions are dominated by uh, by the wealthy countries and therefore are kind of following policies which primarily kind of um, are in line with the with the wealthy um, countries as well. And also that trade agreements, etc., reflect the power structure between the countries and therefore don't necessarily give a level playing field for all countries, but rather kind of are tilted towards developed countries and kind of keep the develop, uh, kind of making it an uphill battle for the developing countries to actually kind of achieve their goals of development. Um, in a way, uh, very often, um, what, uh, what we didn't really look at much, but which is really important, is also um, uh, is the idea about um, the political dimension behind 
uh, development politics. And what we do find is that uh, um, um, is, is that that countries are are often um, um, that uh, that uh, countries have have difficulty to kind of develop their domestic um, uh, markets because the international institutions often set um, um, towards um, towards the uh, the integration of the national market in the global market and not necessarily the development of the domestic market in itself. I mentioned before this, this problem with the microcredit system, but very often also that the export oriented industrialization is easier um, from a policy level to achieve because it brings in external funds as well. And that it is in, depending on the, in the domestic level, it is not necessary. Um, that um, that that leads also to increased domestic um, economic activity. Very often, actually, what we see is that this leads to an um, increased um, um, competition with with domestic products, which are not competitive from a global market. And something like uh, and so the protection and the openness of the markets is a is a very difficult balance, not just. Um, for developing countries, but even for developed countries to kind of find the right balance there. And what we do find is that for developing countries, this is even more difficult to strike because of external pressures as well. Well, and now I would like to kind of um, talk a little bit in the, in the last kind of slides about this idea about, about um, RTS Sen's argument development um, as freedoms. Um, so very often uh, economic development is very much kind of narrowly seen in growth of GDP and therefore kind of maybe growing the national wealth. But um, Amartya Sen is criticizing this, uh, this uh, kind of way of thinking about development and saying like, no, it's not only that there is kind of material goods which are really important. It is really about the domestic, the development of the individual actors and the individual citizens as well. And so he shows that actually kind of economic development is another aspect of freedom. So that freedom, people who have an increased economic development have more opportunities and therefore have more freedoms in, in their own kind of life um, as well. So the living conditions are a crucial aspect of economic development and not just the overall GDP. GDP. So the distribution of the wealth, again, is also a form of crucial importance. So a country can have uh, very high growth rates, um, but maybe it is only benefiting a very small minority um, of the population and the majority of the population is staying poor. So this kind of development is not necessarily kind of in the, might, might on paper look like a large uh, GDP growth, but it's not necessarily in the beneficial overall population, but rather um, a, a small uh, part of the population. Uh, for a very long time, there was the argument about trickling down effect. So if some people get very rich, they will spend more money uh, in the domestic market. Um, and then that will be kind of brought down towards the, the, the more general public and everybody will become richer. This is an, a very much an, a US touted um, idea about trickling down. And in a way it has been taken up by, by the Chinese government as well. Uh, which in the in the beginning of the of the 21st century said let some people get rich first and then the others rich later. Um, what we do find is that this kind of trickling down effect is not very efficient. It doesn't really help. Why? Because um, wealthy people who newly acclaim wealth are not necessarily spending this the, this this wealth uh, among the population, but rather keep it. And the centralization also means that this is very often kind of brought outside of the economic system or spent externally. And so what we do have as a problem is that there is not, this is uh, an inefficient way where economic growth is centralized around a couple of people, which then again become more powerful within the society. And centralization of economic power leads to even more centralization of economic power. Um, so what we 
um, um, what what kind of um, uh, Amartya Sen points out in this kind of discussion is that um, we have, um, for example, if we we have a large amount of people, generally this is very um, very positive um, for for economic development. But what we often find is that actually this large amount of people have limited access um, um, to things like healthcare, clean waters. Um, and so, and very often there is a high level of morbidity, so low, uh, low um, average, um, um, average life expectancy. Uh, um, and therefore, uh, this kind of issues um, also have a, neg a negative aspect of on um, economic development. And what we also find in very often in developing countries is that systematically denied political li liberty and basic rights. Um, so. Um, so what Amartya Sen is saying that this freedom involves both the process and the opportunity. Uh, it is not only about um, about the process, uh, but it's also about the opportunities. And so process that allows freedom of action and decision, but at the same time opportunities uh, to personally change your circumstances. And these two things are kind of aspect of the um, um, of economic development, and it's only in, in according to Amartya Sen, uh, this is only going, only if it goes hand in hand, um, then then econ real economic development can take place. Um, so if there are no opportunities, even um, if the society is free and has um, actions and decisions can be taken, um, people are still deprived of their, of, of their individual kind of um, development. Um, even uh, if the opportunities are available and people can change their circum social, personal and social circumstances, but political freedoms and, and freedoms of action and decision-making are not there, then, um, then development is also inhibited. Um, so um, according to, um, to Amartya Sen, we should not have narrow aspects for the one or the other. We should actually kind of incorporate them both in our understanding of economic and political development. Um, yeah, so in his work, which I highly recommend um, you reading, um, and who is, I do have his book here if you are interested in this. Um, in this work, he is primarily looking and at these kind of the individual as the building block uh, and expanding the capacity as a really important aspect of economic um, development and development of the country as well. Not just looking at the macroeconomic data, um, not just looking at the political kind of aspects of it, but basically the development of the individual, the opportunities of the development of the individual and their capabilities that the idea that this kind of enhanced capabilities can enhance public policy as well. Uh, so that public policy is not something which is kind of, um, kind of coming from an external body or a government which is kind of detached from, the, from society, that, but rather that it comes from society within and the capabilities of the of the uh, public in general. So we do see, so the ideas here really that Developing um, your um, um, the capacities of the individual also develops the capacity of the state. It's not that the state is uh, kind of responsible for the citizens and just guides them in a certain way, but rather that there's an interaction between those two aspects. And so in his words, he's kind of the evaluation is not necessarily kind of based on the effectiveness alone, but rather also on the participation of the society. Um, so, you know, what kind of substantive freedoms do they have? And what kind of um, possibilities do they have to the, um, in, in, uh, evolve as an individual, not only the utility or the real income in itself. And, so in a way, effectiveness is not only the basis of success or failure of the, of the economic development, um, but also the ability of the people to help themselves and influence 
um, their, their course of action, influence their policy decisions in their country, influence their individual kind of um, uh, futures as well, and their state of the world. In a way, very often, so, so in, the, in return, um, uh, Amartya thinks, uh, then thinks that poverty is the deprivation of these kind of capabilities. Um, so it's not only about the low income of the, in, the, the, the citizens um, that they are deprived in, in this, but rather that the depri uh, deprivation of their capabilities. So of course, if they have a very low income, and they can't invest in education. They can't invest in in in, in the future of their um, of their their their, their um, employment of their um, of their um, their work in general. Then this is again, of course, um, um, deprivation of their capabilities. Other kind of aspects here are uh, premature mortality, undernourishment, widespread illiteracy. Uh, illiteracy and other kind of failures to kind of kind of enable people to kind of um, live up to their potential. So in this way, he also sees that unemployment is not not only a deficiency of income, but also the, the ability, uh, um, <clears throat> um, and had, that it has very far-reaching effects on on individual freedoms, um, initiatives, and skills. So it's not, so his basic argument to give you the, the gist is not only to look at, the, at the, uh, the monetary situation of the individuals, but also kind of what kind of capabilities they have to develop themselves and, and how deprived they are from, from, from driving as individuals, families, et cetera. So in a way, markets, we kind of think about markets, deprivation can result that people are denied economic opportunities um, and favorable consequences of these market that markets might have offered, but they cannot access them. But policies can also restrict market opportunities. So people cannot access uh, these opportunities because uh, policies are kind of forbidding or, or, or limiting their opportunities as well. Um, so in a way, um, Amartya Sen is really kind of advocating a, a more holistic approach for this. And I think I want to, uh, to kind of close this, uh, this class um, with a question and discussion which you can think about yourself and maybe we can find some time in, the, um, in, in, our, in our course as well to, dis um, to dis discuss this a bit uh, further. So how are your develop ideas about development? What do you think are the crucial factors um, to kind of have um, economic as well as social development and do we should we focus on the pure economic uh, aspect of development should we focus on capabilities etc and if yes what are the key factors so i hope you enjoyed this class and i look forward to seeing you in in our next meeting until then uh, take care and um yeah see you soon thank you bye bye